Maybe you've heard about the digital currency called Bitcoin. Dogecoin. Tether. Since the early 2010s, cryptocurrencies. Solana, Avalanche, Terra. Have gone from obscure techno babble mocked by the mainstream. Bitcoin is worthless artificial gold. If you're stupid enough to buy, you'll pay the price for it one day. To a financial sector worth at one point over a trillion dollars. Watching history be made. Bitcoin is now up to $111. It's above 57,000 today. Making its earliest adopters incredibly rich. I see it as the future of currency. And attracting droves of speculators hoping to cash in on the digital gold rush. Investors are piling into Bitcoin today. But from the outside, it's easy to lose track of the technology behind this massive mountain of wealth. What's the value associated with? What is it that makes it worth it? What exactly is a cryptocurrency? Is it a store of value, a speculative asset, an innovative new technology, or a Ponzi scheme peddled by shameless grifters? To understand what cryptocurrencies are, it helps to go back and learn where they came from in the first place. So let's rewind. The year is 2009. U.S. financial markets in crisis. It was a manic Monday in the financial markets. Just after a catastrophic economic meltdown of historic proportions. The Dow tumbled more than 500 points. There's been a widespread loss of confidence. If nothing is done, this recession could linger for years. And public trust in financial institutions is at a major low point, understandably. Meanwhile, on an obscure web forum somewhere in the internet, a mysterious user going by Satoshi Nakamoto, whose real identity is still unknown, starts making posts about his idea for a new kind of digital money that doesn't require any trust in third parties. He calls it Bitcoin, and he describes it in this nine-page white paper as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system that would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. Now, the wording isn't very sensational, but this is completely revolutionary. Something like this is unheard of. Money without banks, money without a government. He presents Bitcoin as an alternative to fiat currency. That's government-backed money. And he goes on to lay out in detail how exactly that would work. The first thing to understand is that Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are decentralized. There are no banks or governments running the show. Instead, cryptocurrencies are run by the users. That's what Satoshi meant by peer-to-peer. -peer. Cutting out financial gatekeepers and middlemen allows for faster transactions, lower fees, more privacy, and even micropayments, which are impractical for traditional banks. But despite all their flaws, financial institutions do play important roles in the financial system. They hold our money for us, they facilitate transactions, they prevent fraud, and they just, they generally keep the economy going. So if you remove those institutions, like Bitcoin does, how does the whole thing function? Satoshi thought of that, and he devoted a lot of his white paper to describing his solution. It's a newfangled system called blockchain. You can think of the blockchain as a complete history of every cryptocurrency transaction, going all the way back to the beginning and it's all kept in one long list. Now that list is managed by a network of the cryptocurrency's users. Anybody can join in by installing some open source software in their computers. In doing so, they join that cryptocurrency's network of blockchain accountants and cooperate with each other to verify and record new transactions, adding them to the blockchain. You don't have to participate in this network or install any software in order to buy or use cryptocurrency. But anybody who does join the network is fulfilling a fundamental role and contributing to the security of the blockchain. Now there's one really important point here. Everybody on that network downloads and keeps a copy of the blockchain on their computers and they update it. But it's really important, it's crucial, that everybody agrees on the same blockchain, the same exact history of transactions. Then there's no question about who has how much cryptocurrency at any point in time because you can just look back and reference the history of transactions. But that's only as long as everybody agrees. With cryptocurrencies, consensus is key. Consensus in the network. But consensus is tricky in a big leaderless group. So 
How are disagreements resolved if there are two or more competing versions of the blockchain floating around at one time? And what if a fraudster tries to rewrite history by undoing a transaction in order to reclaim their money and spend the same Bitcoin twice? That's known as double spending. And Satoshi gave that a lot of thought. It's even mentioned in the opening lines of the Bitcoin white paper. These are serious challenges, but it's also where the blockchain really shines. There's a sophisticated set of rules and security mechanisms hard-coded into the blockchain that make it virtually impossible to tamper with and ensure that there's always consensus on the same list of transactions. These security and consensus mechanisms are rooted in cryptography, and that's why they're called cryptocurrencies. The cryptography itself gets really complex, but it's basically a foolproof method of verifying beyond a doubt that something is true. For example, cryptography can verify that I'm the true owner of the Bitcoin I'm sending, or it can verify which is the true version of the blockchain. There's more to it than that, but that's really the big idea. We'll get into all the details in another video that explains the blockchain, so you might want to watch that after this one. We've talked a lot about Bitcoin, but what about all the other cryptocurrencies out there? There are literally thousands of so-called altcoins, which can make the crypto space, yeah, well, a little overwhelming to a newcomer, right? So what's the difference between all these cryptocurrencies? Well, it's safe to say that most, if not all, these other cryptocurrencies were modeled after Bitcoin, which came first. Some of them are pretty much just straight up Bitcoin clones. They've like copied and pasted the code and changed one or two small things and then given it a new name and a new logo. But others are, they differ more significantly and they were created to offer more capabilities and features than Bitcoin was ever designed to have. They kind of take the idea of blockchain and just push it even further. You can think of these altcoins as spin-offs of Bitcoin. They tweak some of the code to get around some of Bitcoin's built-in limitations like the restrictive speed and complexity of the transactions. Many altcoins are kind of like tech startups. They're offering innovative products and services built on a more sophisticated version of the blockchain. So this is a technology, it's a computing language, and I can build an app on it. And the applications they offer go well beyond simple financial transactions. This is where you get NFTs, decentralized finance, Web3, dApps, the list goes on, right? Stablecoins are another category of crypto. They're pegged to another asset, like the US dollar, making their value less volatile than other cryptocurrencies, while still offering a lot of the features. And then there are shitcoins, which are basically low-effort clones of existing cryptocurrencies with no discernible value or purpose. And this is where you see a lot of scams. But across the board, the fundamental nature of the blockchain underlying all these cryptocurrencies is still the same. All right, all right, all right, all right. That's, that's a lot of technical stuff, I know. Now, what if you want to go and buy crypto? What do you do? Well, the easiest way is to use an exchange. And lots of exchanges have sprung up over the past few years. In fact, we have one of our own, Currency.com. You might want to check it out. What you can do with that cryptocurrency depends where you are and when you're watching this, really. The number of things you can buy with crypto is small but growing. And who knows whether or not you'll be able to pay rent with Bitcoin in the years to come. That's anybody's guess. What's growing faster are the number of options out there for earning returns on your crypto, especially through a burgeoning new sector called decentralized finance, or DeFi. In a nutshell, you'll see things like high interest crypto savings accounts, staking or yield farming, there's a lot more. These are new ventures that often promise very high returns. But wait, wait, it's important to note that this is really new, this whole sector. And these options are currently unregulated and uninsured. So they can be super risky, even by crypto standards. And people have lost a lot of money this way. Just be careful. Just be careful out there. Now, if you bought cryptocurrency on an exchange, you could keep it there. That's fine. Or you could move it to a wallet, which is way more secure and recommended if your holdings are significant. A wallet is really just a way of managing your public and private keys, which are kind of like your account and pin numbers that you use to spend your crypto. There are a few different types of wallets. There's paper wallets, software wallets, hot wallets, cold wallets, custodial, non-custodial, but that's all a topic for another video. So by now you might be wondering, okay, where's the value in a cryptocurrency? What are they even good for? 
The answer depends very much on who you ask. You think this is a currency? A currency that's really going to work eventually? Well, I think it is working. And I believe it's going to be the number one currency in the world. Many people will tell you that cryptocurrencies are the future of money. That one day, Bitcoin will replace the US dollar as the world's reserve currency. And that it's only a matter of time until we're all using crypto to pay for everything, from rent to groceries. No, I'd like to pay with Bitcoin. Another feature of cryptocurrencies is that they can't easily be confiscated or manipulated by a government. So many see it as a powerful tool to combat financial oppression and to empower people living under an autocratic regime or a mismanaged, hyperinflationary economy. Still others see in cryptocurrencies a disruptive tidal wave of technological innovation. And they'll tell you that the blockchain and all it entails will revolutionize the world around us. From finance and law, to gaming, art, supply chains, the list goes on. Cryptocurrencies have also long been seen as a speculative asset and a store of value. That's probably how most of us heard of it or came across it. And a lot of institutional and retail investors see it as part of a resilient, modern portfolio. The speculative nature of cryptocurrencies isn't really a built-in feature and has more to do with the hype and interest around them, which changes with the times, it goes up and down. And you'll see for yourself, if you look at the candlestick charts, that Bitcoin and pretty much any other cryptocurrency except for a stable coin, they go up and down like crazy. They're really, really volatile. Now, whatever their true value, whether cryptocurrencies will change finance forever or be remembered as another frenzied bubble, there's no question that, for now at least, they're definitely worth paying attention to and maybe even understanding. So there you have it, a brief beginner's guide to cryptocurrencies. We touched on a lot of different technical topics here that go much deeper. So if you wanna learn more, this is part of a series of explainers diving into the fundamentals of crypto. Now, next up, you might wanna check out our video diving deep into the details of the blockchain and how that works. And trust me when I say, it's really, really interesting to get your head around it. And hey, thanks so much for watching. Hit that subscribe button, hit like on the video. We'll see you next time.